Yay! Okay, good morning everyone. First I want to thank um, Dr. Resnick for giving a really great talk. Can you give a round of applause for him? Let's introduce our second speaker, Dr. Brian Bowen, who's coming to us from University of Hawaii. Um, he is an authority on fishes. He's written over nine book chapters and 114 publications according to his CV, although I'm pretty sure there are more now. Um, he got his master's at um, College of William & Mary under uh, Jack Music, and then he got his PhD under John Avis um, at Georgia. And without further ado, I'd like to give a short speak and introduce Dr. Brian Bowen. summary with six dissertations, uh, several postdoc projects, all of Hawaii 
And when you get down to Easter Island over here, it's about 130 species. So the gradient is very strong. And right now, there's three, three primary theories to explain this. One, that the hotspots are centers of speciation. That the intense competition forges new species with high fitness that radiate out across the world and replace older species. Uh, second theory is that their hotspots are uh, centers of accumulation. That there's an Indian Ocean fauna, in this case, and a Pacific fauna, and that they just overlap in this area. And the third theory is kind of the antithesis of the first one, that, oh, I'm sorry, centers of overlap here between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. Third theory is that they're centers of accumulation, that species originate out on the periphery into pauperate areas and radiate inward. Now, there's two features about these oceanic systems that I want to point out to you before I proceed. One is the huge dispersal of these animals. Okay? The example I'd like to use is squirrels versus squirrel fish. Now, a squirrel born in Hyde Park in London cannot leave progeny in Central Park in New York. A squirrel fish can do that. Their larvae and post-transformation uh, juveniles are out in the ocean for 60 days or more, and they are hugely dispersed. Okay, the second thing I want to mention is that part of the motivation for this research is that if you look under coral head in this region, you'll see two, three, or more species of squirrel fish <clears throat> that are very similar. Sometimes they're sister species, and yet there's no apparent geographic barriers that have created these divisions, speciation events. Okay? Now, I mentioned the center of accumulation, or center of overlap. Here's the Indian Ocean. Here's the Pacific Ocean. Um, here's Australia down here in New Guinea. What I want to show you is the light area is contemporary sea level, uh, continental, um, our land, just land. But during every <coughs> glacial epoch, the sea level drops over 100 meters. And during the last glaciation, this is the gray area, was dry land. Australia is connected to New Guinea, and there's almost an impenetrable barrier between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. And this might be the starting point for speciation, this physical isolation. But the interesting thing about it that I'll come back to is that it's an intermittent barrier. It pops up and down every 100,000 years or so. Okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's few barriers to dispersal in the ocean. The conventional allopatric model for speciation is that a population will occupy an area like this, a mountain range goes up that splits area two from area three, and then maybe a piece of continent drifts off area one, okay? And this will create area two and three will split off first, and then area one will split off from area two. Conventional, uh, what is, uh, conventional, well, allopatric speciation, and uh, the problem is, there's really very few barriers to explain speciation in the sea. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So the new twist to all this <coughs> is that it's become very apparent that populations in the ocean do not have to be physically isolated to diverge and speciate. As I said, we can find sister species occupying the same habitat. There might be small differences in their niche partitioning, but they're not evident, and they're definitely not speciating by physical isolation. The first example I want to use to this is from Luis Roach's work on this beastie here, this wrasse, Halicaris bivitatus. He did a survey of the animal across this region and found that there were two deep lineages, uh, the blue lineage and the red lineage here. The red lineage was found offshore and along these uh, dry continental coastlines here. The blue lineage along this area, which has a lot more freshwater runoff and a lot more turbidity in the water. And in Bermuda, he found them partitioning into inshore reefs and outer reefs. 
more oceanic habitats. And this is what's thought to be a single species, definitely each other's closest <coughs> relatives. Okay, and they are partitioning without physical barriers by habitat. My favorite example of this is genus Hemulon. And you don't need to worry about the details of this phylogeny. Uh, they're called grunts. Uh, Dan, you're a fish guy. Why are they called grunts? Because they grunt. They grunt. <laughs> okay? They grunt. Thank you. Good, good fish knowledge. Okay. Now, we look at sister species, very strongly supported sister species, and they have identical ranges with no apparent barriers. Identical ranges, no apparent barriers. Okay, what's going on here? Three species, all three have identical distributions, and yet they have radiated into well-supported lineages that are recognized as separate species. The same here on the other side of the isthmus barrier uh, for these two species. What's going on here? Well, it's believed that these species reproduce at night, and what kind of key do they use to recognize conspecifics? David? I mean, Dan? They grunt. That's right. They grunt. So you automatically, you can immediately see a way for segregation of populations by vocal cues without physical isolation. And the examples of this have accumulated across the map recently. Um, I've mentioned the grunts already. There are algae that segregate into high and low intertidal, uh, believed to see, be the same species, but genetically distinct. And of course, in, in the intertidal, you have desiccation above the waterline, you have creation below the waterline. So there could be strong selective pressures. I mentioned the halicarious wrasse. These sponges segregated to coral and mangrove habitats that are adjacent. Caribbean basslet that segregates by depth. Um, this one, one of my favorites by Phil Mundy. It's a goby species that lives on these acropolar corals, and it is apparently speciated in the same areas by host shifts, by shifting corals. Hawaiian limpets, the work of Dr. Chris Bird at Corpus Christi, has shown that they speciated in Hawaii into low intertidal, medium intertidal, and high intertidal. And the fact that the water map, water energy splashing on them causes the release of gametes may be the key point where they can reproduce at separate times, at least separate times of the tidal level. And the examples go on and on and on. There's just lots of examples where you can see there's speciation happening in the ocean but it's not along geographic or even oceanographic barriers. Okay, so we know that allopatric speciation occurs in this vast transglobal aquatic medium. There's loads of examples, and it may even be the predominant mode of speciation. But we also know now that there's speciation along ecological barriers as well. And a lot of the examples you'll see have accumulated just in the last five to 10 years. Okay, so let's get back to our three hypotheses. Center of speciation, center of accumulation, and center of overlap, okay? Now, how can you tell these apart? Well, the answer is you can't always, but sometimes you get lucky. Here's a parsimony network for the olive ridley turtle. Now, each one of these lines between the dashes is a mutation, okay? And the geography indicates where these dots, which are the haplotypes, are found. But what you can see here is that at least for the modern radiation of, Ken of Olive Ridley, the highest diversity is here in the Indo-Pacific area, uh, also over here. But just three mutations away are all the haplotypes found in nesting niches in the East Pacific, a very recent colonization. And only two mutations away in the other direction is all the olive ridleys that have been sampled to date in the Atlantic. And this includes Brazil, Suriname, French Guiana, and the nesting colony over here in Africa. Okay? So in some cases, the network alone will give you a pretty strong indication 
of the region of origin, at least the most recent region of origin for these species. And I want to note, for the phylogeneticists in the audience, I don't need an outgroup to see this. Okay, an outgroup can definitely help at times, especially to, to figure out where the ancestral origin of the group is, but it's not always necessary. Okay, so to review the theories, center of speciation, okay, everything radiating out from here, center of overlap, two faunas that overlap, and center of accumulation, things originating out of periphery. I showed you the first example of center of speciation, the olive ridleys radiating out. Now there's a lot of work that supports the center of origin, and I'm just going to give one example here. Barbara and Bellwood looked at these West Pacific grasses, genus Halicaris, and they said definitely they're originating right here in the coral triangle. Okay? And Dr. Jack Briggs has accumulated a lot of biogeographic evidence that says the same thing. That in many genera, for example, the highest diversity or the oldest uh, lineages appear to be in this area. Okay, so we've got a pretty good database that supports center of origin. How about center of accumulation? Well, Giacomo Bernardi and his group looked at another group of thalassoma rasses, and they said, no, we see just the opposite. We see these things originating out on the periphery in the low biodiversity areas and accumulating in the center. Okay? So, we've got evidence for that hypothesis as well. Now, how about the center of overlap? That's based initially on the distribution of sister species. There's many groups with sister species in the Indian Ocean and Pacific. And indeed, they overlap here. And in many cases, they hybridize. The work of, of John Paul Hobbs at James Cook University has shown this is a hybridization hotspot for these species that have otherwise allopatric distribution. So there's plenty of evidence right off the bat from taxonomy for the center of overlap. But let's look within species, okay? This is a dissertation work of Michelle Gaither. She sampled across the indo <coughs> And when I say that this is the 10 years of work and six dissertations, this is why. These people have gone out and sampled 20 or more locations usually isolated areas throughout the Indo-Pacific. What Michelle found was there was one lineage within this species in the Indian Ocean, there's one lineage in the Pacific, and here they seem to be breathing into each other. See the Indian Ocean form? Sometimes makes it all the way out to the Lion Islands here. And the Pacific form seems to make it a little way into the Indian Ocean. And she interpreted this as center of overlap. The key distinction here is it's within species. She's seeing the same process that taxonomists and phylogeneticists define between species. And this pattern now is documented in starfish. In each case, here's the parsimony network, Pacific lineage, Indian Ocean lineage. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Indian Ocean lineage, Pacific. Pacific, Indian Ocean, overlap. Both lineages here, here. Squirrelfish, same thing. The Indian Ocean form seems to have made it into the Pacific pretty far, and we do see Pacific genotypes occasionally here. The grouper I just showed you, uh, hammerhead shark, same thing. Pacific lineage, Indian Ocean lineage, overlap. And finally, this, uh, what is limpid? In the uh, Pacific, Indian Ocean, and a little bit of overlap in the middle. So the center of overlap theory also has a lot of data, okay? And again, this may be the starting point, this barrier between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. So we now have evidence for center of accumulation, center of overlap, and especially for the center of speciation in the hotspot. What do you do at this point? Well, a prudent researcher might move on to other research topics because it looks like all the answers are correct. Okay, species are indeed seen to be arising from throughout the Pacific Ocean. 
you'll find this in biology. You know, in physics, you can take a particle and say, is it positive, neutral, or negative? And you're going to get a clear-cut answer. In biology, you don't get such clean dichotomies. You can propose several theories and find out they're all correct. All right, so let's shift the focus a little bit to those peripheral habitats. I've shown you evidence for center of speciation radiating out and the center of accumulation or the center of overlap between the Indian Pacific. What about speciation in those peripheral habitats, which would support the center of accumulation? Well, for that, let's return home to where I live. Uh, the Hawaiian marine fauna, first of all, it's an oceanic hotspot. Volcanoes push up these islands as the crust moves this way. Um, <clears throat> so the oldest hot spots have resided, have sunk down. The I'm, these are volcanic hot spots, not biodiversity hot spots. The youngest one, the big island of Hawaii, is still growing. And I want to point out here that recently, in 2006, this whole area was set aside as a marine protected area. At the time, the largest one in the world. And there's a lot of good questions going on about what that does to benefit the inhabited Hawaiian Islands, which are heavily fished, which I'd be happy to talk about later. But I want you to recognize this is a truly big area. Okay, if we put the big island in New Orleans, the end of this protected area, well, the beginning starts here in Dallas and ends over there in Las Vegas. That's how big it is. It's uninhabited. It's nearly pristine reef. It's a great place to look for something that's close to baseline healthy reefs. Okay, let's get back. What's happening in Hawaii? The conventional wisdom is that things get to Hawaii, and if they're isolated there for long enough, they'll become the Hawaiian species. But that's the end of the line. There's no further radiations, and Hawaii is more or less an evolutionary dead end. And that thinking has persisted in the literature for about 30 years. But Jeff Ebel, for his dissertation, he looks at this yellow tank. And he finds, first of all, the basal haplotypes in an MTDNA network are in Hawaii. But I want to show you another line of evidence, which is coalescence. Now, this is subject to some caveats about population boom and bust. But in this case, Jeff saw a clear uh, what I'd call line evidence of colonization. The oldest populations are in Hawaii. Now the prevailing currents are westward. 170,000 years is a coalescent time for this population in Ogasawara. 150,000 years here, and only 90,000 here. Oh, and Johnston, which is adjacent to Hawaii, seems almost as old for the contemporary populations. So in this case, you can almost see, I, I should also mention this thing is by far most abundant in Hawaii. It's much less common out here. But it appears, you can almost see a line of colonization heading out from Hawaii through the Pacific. But there's more than that. This is migrate, estimates of migration, um, mtDNA and microsats. Going out of Hawaii, the migration estimate is two per generation, six per generation. Coming back into Hawaii, it's negligible, essentially zero. Hawaii compared to the Marianas, the same thing. There seems to have been gene flow out, just about nothing going back in. And the same thing going down here to Micronesia. High gene flow out of Hawaii, not much going back in. So at least within this species, Hawaii is exporting genetic diversity, and we think it's exported this species from Hawaii. We have even better evidence. This is Lena Bay uh, at James Cook with this parrotfish, Chlorus sordidus. There's an Indian Ocean lineage, just like you see before, and a Pacific lineage. And then there's something they call the Hawaiian subclave, which has obviously been isolated for a little while from the central and western Indo-Pacific. 
But what's interesting about this is not that Hawaii is an isolated subclade. Hawaii haplotypes are indicated here in gray. What's interesting about this part is that these red and blue ha and green haplotypes were once observed downstream from Hawaii in the West Pacific. Okay? So there's isolated lineage in Hawaii. It is exporting genetic diversity to the West. And the same thing was found by Fitzpatrick et al. in another parrotfish, that there seems to be a net gene flow out of Hawaii into other areas. So, this is a bunch of new literature going from 2001 to more recently, that Hawaii is not an evolutionary graveyard, and it can actually export genetic diversity and, we think, taxonomic diversity. Hawaii is both a source and recipient of marine biodiversity, and if it's a source, then of course that supports that center of accumulation hypothesis. Okay, now let's move on to the Red Sea. This is work done by Joey D. Batista and Michael Berman, uh, published just six months ago, where they examined all of these fish species in the Red Sea and compared them to the Indian Ocean out here. Okay, conspecifics believed to be the same species. Now the interesting thing, an enduring biogeographic enigma, is that the Red Sea is believed to dry up every glacial cycle, or at least get down to the point so desiccated that it's hypersaline like the Dead Sea and cannot support reef fauna, including corals and their associated taxa. That's because the Gulf, I mean the mouth of the Red Sea here, is only about 130 meters deep. So sea level drops about 130 meters during ice ages. There's no seawater flow into here. And having Egypt on this side, Saudi Arabia on this side, you know it's a hot, dry place. And the geological evidence is that it really does mostly dry up. But if that's the case, then how come we see endemic species in there that appear to be a million years or more apart from their sister species in the Indian Ocean? Absolutely wide open question that has yet to be answered. This group at King Abdullah University is working on it. But for the point here, Joey D. Batista found that a lot of the Indian Ocean stuff seems to have made it into the Red Sea, but some, at least a couple of these taxa these two seem to have originated here and come out, okay? So again, here we have a peripheral habitat that it seems to be exporting biodiversity into the broader Indo-Pacific. And this angelfish, the regal angelfish, Pygopleides dicanthus, is one of those species that, according to a conventional molecular clock, the ones in the Red Sea are 800,000 years apart from the ones out here. And, and really, how can that be if this habitat dries up every 100,000 years? We don't know. Okay, my favorite example. Let's get back into the Caribbean. With about 400 fish species, well, maybe 500. And this is the biodiversity hotspot for the Atlantic. The Atlantic is a much simpler system in terms of coral reef biogeography. There's a Caribbean province there's a Brazilian province separated by the outflow of the Amazon. Now the outflow of the Amazon, you guys are all familiar with the Mississippi River. The outflow of the Amazon is 50 times the outflow of the Mississippi River. And there's lots of stories about uh, sailors that are in trouble out in the open ocean. They dip water out of the ocean and it's fresh water because this plume goes so far out into the Atlantic. It also blows north, so that this entire coastline here is silt-dominated. So there's no corals between here and south of the Amazon. Okay? Besides that, there's a mid-Atlantic province, Ascension Island and St. Helena here, and there's an outpost of Atlantic coral reefs here in the Gulf of Guinea. Nice simple system, just four biogeographic provinces but we're going to focus on the hotspot here in the outpost of Brazil. Okay? Within Palicaries, the Rasses again, um, blue codes for haplotypes observed in Brazil, 
Caribbean is in red. And what you see is what's clearly an ancestral haplotype here, giving rise to Brazilian haplotypes that give rise to the Caribbean haplotype. Okay? What do we have here? We have a center of origin exporting biodiversity. According to that center of speciation theory. But then we have the peripheral area kicking biodiversity back into the hot spot, which is the center of accumulation hypothesis. You can see both right here. Okay? Uh, parrotfish. Let's get the same color coding. Um, what seems to be the ancestral version, this species, gives rise to a Brazilian species which has then colonized back to the hot spot, back into the Caribbean. And my favorite example is this parrotfish, Caribbean parrotfish, that has given rise to a Brazilian parrotfish that has given rise to a Caribbean parrotfish. Three species, okay? So right here, within a single phylogeny, you can see the center of origin, centers of hot spots radiating out species, and you can see accumulation of biodiversity from a peripheral habitat. Okay? They're all working. Based on this, and a lot of really good work, um, Jack Briggs and I wrote a review paper, but the foundations are really Serge Floater, the Brazilian ichthyologist who sorted this out. <coughs> Based on the distribution and phylogenetic affinities of the Atlantic fish, and we can do this again because it's such a simple system relative to the Indo-Pacific. We see Africa collided with Eurasia about 12 to 18 million years ago. And some of the Atlantic fishes, especially over here, are Tethian relics. Their closest relatives are over here and they tend to be fairly old generally. Okay? A lot of the Caribbean stuff has sister species over here, okay? Three million year separation for the rise of the Isthmus of Panama. Many, many species pairs across the systems. And there's a great review paper by Harris Lessio at the Smithsonian on this topic. Okay, a third avenue for this Atlantic reef biodiversity is Southern Africa. There's a subtropical Agulis system here that runs right into frigid Benguela upwelling here. Now most of the time this area is a death sentence for tropical fauna. They get into this cold upwelling and it's game over. But at the end of every ice age the Benguela current subsides and the Indian Ocean warm tropical fauna intrudes into the Atlantic. And we know this based on sediment cores from this area that show um, warm tropical plankton from the Indian Ocean in, in the layers of the sediment cores, roughly at the end of each ice age, 100,000 year cycle. Okay? And as I showed you, the Caribbean and Brazil are swapping species back and forth. Okay? So we can point to these four origins of tropical biodiversity in the Atlantic. And of course, the important fifth origin is there's new species originating, especially here and here. Maybe here as well, but we're having, it's, it's a more difficult place to sample. Okay? So there's a feedback going on between the biodiversity hotspots and the peripheral areas. Now another one of the enduring mysteries when we're looking at the origins of these species is sister species that co-occur in the same areas. Well, the question really is, are they sister species? <clears throat> With striking color differences despite apparent gene flow. In some cases, these things are genetically indistinguishable. They're described as separate species. Uh, and they may have differences in assortative mating. Uh, blue hamlets, selectively prefer to mate with blue hamlets. But the question is, <clears throat> what's going on with these species? Or are they species? Are they, do they even qualify as species? And genomics, I think, is going to be the technique that 
music that really cracks this question. And I want to give you just one example from the Indo-Pacific, which is this beautiful flame angel fish. Uh, Jenny Schultz, as part of her graduate work in Hawaii, sequenced mtDNA and did a little genetic, um, a couple of nuclear introns, and found that these color morphs in different parts of the Pacific were genetically indistinguishable, okay? No significant difference <clears throat> across the Indo-Pacific. Well, Michelle Gaither, Luis Rocha, two names that hopefully are familiar to you now, um, they start looking at this with genomics. They look at about 3,000 loci across the nuclear genome, and they start finding loci that pop out as different. Okay, I think there's somewhere around 40 loci that are significantly different, what we call outlier FSTs. Uh, <clears throat> we look at the range, FST is the measure of genetic differentiation, and we look only at the loci that are 99% outliers to be very conservative. Not even 95% different, 99% outliers. There's several dozen loci that show differences, and when you start to try to find out where those loci are, you can compare their sequences to available data at GenBank. They start clustering around coloration, um, melanin pathways, and those kind of things. So in fact, what looks to be genetically undifferentiated with, new, with neutral loci is, in fact, with some loci under selection, we're starting to see that there, there may be some differentiation that's pertinent to evolution. And I want to point out this paper. When can ecological speciation be detected with neutral loci? Well, our answer was never with neutral loci. But once we really got into the genome, we started seeing a differentiation that may be a precursor of speciation. All right, so let's sum this up. Speciation mechanisms. Recent studies have overturned several assumptions about speciation, indicating especially <clears throat> what um, people like Andrew have been advocating for years. We're catching up here in the marine realm. There's a lot of evidence now that there's speciation without geographic isolation. Okay? In terms of those biogeographic theories, we see speciation both in the hot spots, presumably with intense competition, and in the peripheral archipelagos, possibly under ecological release. Now, you probably all know what groupers are. Aside from the fact that they're delicious, they're a primary predator on coral reefs. If you're a grouper in the coral triangle, you have to compete indirectly or directly with about 115 other grouper species. If you're a grouper in Hawaii, you have to compete with one other species, actually two because one of them, another one was introduced about 50 years ago. And I'm not an ecologist by training, but I've tried this out on several people, this idea of ecological release. And they say it's, a, it's defensible. And we have examples now of fish that we know arrived in Hawaii in the last 50 or 100 years. And the grouper, Cephalopholis argus, is the best example. If you compare it to its native range, in the new range in Hawaii, it has gotten Different life history characters, it grows faster, higher fecundity, and it's probably gotten some release from parasites. But what's most important to me is it's undergone dietary shifts. So I think it's defensible to say that ecological release in these peripheral habitats may also be another route for speciation. But that's probably the more speculative part of this argument. And finally, the biodiversity feedback. The exchange of lineages between the hotspots and peripheral areas is synergistic, promoting biodiversity in both. And in this respect, you know that the Indo-Pacific has a lot more diversity than the Atlantic. That might be due in part to size or habitat availability. But I also want to point out that this hotspot has halos of islands of peripheral habitats on both sides. 
So if there's going to be feedback, this system is a lot more conducive to that feedback than the Caribbean Brazil feedback system, where there's, there's really not a halo of peripheral habitats. And finally, uh, this is a, a figure that uh, Briggs and Bowen, Jack Briggs and I put up, showing this feedback. We know most of the diversity is moving into the Red Sea, some's moving out, same with Hawaii, same with the East Pacific, same over here. And finally, everything that I've presented here, almost everything, has been published in the last year. This is, as I said, an effort of about a decade, not just by our lab, but by people at James Cook, Cynthia Reginos, Giacomo Bernardi, Paul Barber at UCLA, all been working towards this. And speciation is different in the sea. And I don't mean by that that the mechanisms are different. It's just that there's a shift in the balance between geographic isolation and ecological partitions. Because geographic isolation, there really isn't a whole lot of. When you've got species that can go up into the water column and drift for 30 days. In the case of some of the surgeon fish and the moray eels, 100 days or more, okay? Now there are many counterexamples to this in the ocean. The clownfish, their larvae get up, go out for seven or eight days, they form a halo around an island, and then they come right back in, okay? So this isn't a universal concept, but for a lot of marine biodiversity, Speciation is different in the sea because dispersal is different and barriers to these animals are much fewer. Okay, so that leads us up to possible points of discussion. As I said, these ideas are fairly new. They've gelled just in the last few years. Um, does this apply to marginal seas like the Gulf of Mexico? I don't know. Are there things, there are endemic species to the Gulf of Mexico, there aren't a lot, but are they um, producing diversity that goes back into the Caribbean? Does this apply to marine pelagics? There is a paper in submission right now that indicates that the green sea turtles that are throughout this area, there's an isolated population here in Hawaii, and it looks like this area was the um, ancestor for all the green turtles that occur along this coast in Central America. So the turtle people are tentatively lining up on this, saying we see at least parts of this biodiversity feedback. Um, haven't heard much from the marine mammal people, but they're not especially talkative. And um, <laughs> plankton. Oceanic wanderers, and finally, does the, is, this, is this a reality for terrestrial fauna? There's a little bit of evidence that it is. Like um, the great American citizen, what do they call it? With the South American fauna crossed the isthmus of Panama and got into North America, a few, new species originated, and a few of them make it back to, to South America. But I'm not sure about that. Um, maybe Tom can comment on that. Um, so, we're still looking at the generality of this mechanism. We've got a lot of evidence that occurs in the sea. And next up, we're going to hear about this ecological speciation in freshwater and terrestrial perspectives from Dr. Andrew Hendry and his esteemed colleagues. <laughs> and this is the review paper last year that came out that summarizes a lot of this stuff. If you shoot me an email, I'd be happy to send you a copy. And with that, I say thanks and maybe a little time for questions.